myself the question, am I comfortable? Am I feeling okay about myself? Do I need to tune in? Like Yannick said earlier today, when we tune in that you can just open a page of the Cosmic Journal and get all the information that you need. And so that's what I do with this Wayne Dyer audio thing. I tune in every once in a while, I just have a little taste and I'd love for you to use the video trainings that are here today to be part of this. And so now I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker to you. This man is a new friend, a new collaborator, a new colleague. You're currently on mute, so I'm gonna ask you to take yourself off mute, Wade. Um, you know, sometimes you meet someone and you're like, how did you come to be in <laughs> How did, I mean, I'm weird and I know that and I collect weird people and it's my favorite thing to do in the whole world. And then I met you and I'm like, yes, we are kin. It's so important. It so makes me so happy. And so Wade Davis, when we got chatting and we were getting prepared for you to be part of this amazing Future Her conference, and I asked you, what's your title? And you said to me, I'm a former NFL player and I'm a feminist. And if that doesn't make your jaw drop, ladies and gentlemen, I do not know what does. The perfect blend, right? <laughs> it is. It makes so much sense. NFL player, urgh, feminist. Ah. So I would love for us to start off, Wade, and I'd just love to hear some of your origin story, just how, how you came to be these years that got you to this place. It does, we don't have to go from zero to today. We can just start at the beginning and we'll weave our way through it. But I'm so happy you're here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited to sit in conversation with you. Me too. So tell us about your origin story. Yeah, so I'm a Southerner. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. I spent most of my childhood, though, in Shreveport, Louisiana. Um, I'm also a church boy. I'm a huge mama's boy. Um, I'm, the, I'm the baby of the family. I have three older siblings who are all, who are all women identified. Um, and I'm also uh, someone who, at a young age, realized that I was really good in the sport of football. If you ever meet me in person, which hopefully we will one day, I'm not that big. I'm not that tall. Um, I was fast and pretty smart. Um, and I was someone whose grandmother did not want me to play the sport of football because she thought I was too small and scrawny. Um, but when I moved to Colorado, my stepfather was like, look, this little boy is watching the sport of football every single day. He's pushing us to let him play. So like, let's let him, him play. So even though I played in the backyard um, as a kid, um, and as a kid, I played a game called Smear the Queer actually, which some of your, your listeners may know and your, yourself, but the idea of Smear the Queer is you have a football and a group of kids and you throw the football up in the air and the quote unquote queer is the one that actually has the most courage who picks up the football and runs the longest distance trying to get through all of the other kids as those kids are, are trying to, to tackle you. Um, and at I the time- Smear the Queer. Yeah, so it's called smear the queer. Some people call it throw up tackle. Some people call it kill the man, right? Like, like there are lots of really, um, really exciting, fun names about this uh, game. Such a great um, but, kids game, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and also, as a little kid, I was I was someone who also loved to play non, let's say, stereotypical boys games, right? Like I used to love to play double dutch and jacks. Like I was really great at jacks. Um, but what was interesting during that time was that, um, you know, it's a time in your life where people are trying to put you in boxes, right? Like, you know, boys do this, girls do this, and the twain shall, shall never meet. Um, but, but then as I got older into high school, when I realized that I was attracted to other boys, like that's when I started to understand that I had um, ingested all of that, you know, wrong programming when it comes to gender, gender identity, gender performance, and, and all of that. And unfortunately, when I realized that, that I was gay, I attempted to kill off a part of myself, right? Because mm -hmm. I didn't believe that, that anyone, the world, or even family members would embrace me and accept me. Um, the one thing that I did, though, was I used that as fuel, right? So even though I wasn't the biggest, the smartest, the fastest, I used that as fuel. I ended up going to play college ball in the state of Utah at a school called Weber State. Um, I was good enough to have some NFL teams come to practices, 
you know, I did the whole trying out for NFL teams, you know, when they come to test you. And I was signed as a free agent by the Tennessee Titans after my senior year. Um, I spent a year with the Titans, got sent over to NFL Europe when that existed. So I spent 11 weeks in Barcelona, I mean, in Berlin, Germany. I went back to Tennessee, got shipped to the Seattle Seahawks, went back to NFL Europe, spent time in Barcelona, Spain. And then my, my last year in the NFL was with Washington. And then um, when my career ended, I was no longer, I'm good enough to get cut, let's say that. Um, I moved to New York City because I wanted to see if I could actually exist in the world as more of myself as a gay man. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a transformative moment because I was introduced to so many different people. You know, even, even though I had traveled around a lot, I was still always hiding a big part of me. Um, and I don't use the language of like coming out I use the language of a friend of mine, his name is Darnell Moore, and he says that we invite the world in. So at some mm. point I invited the world in to understand who I was. And, you know, for me, the language of the closet connotes something that I was actually doing wrong, right? It connotes me to the correlation of a wire hanger or a smelly shoe, right? Like, no, like I didn't invite the world in to, to get to know who I was because the world didn't honor my humanity by letting me know that I could expose more of myself to them. Um, but I was fortunate en en enough at that time to take a job in an LGBTQ youth center called the Hedrick Martin Institute. That was where I was introduced to feminism. I was introduced mm -hmm. to Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and Gloria Steinem because I did something deeply, deeply sexist. I, I, I had a leader um, who called me in and who took me through a very emotional self-reflective journey that helped me understand um, that feminism was not about the other, but it was actually about me. Um, and feminism in many ways um, brought me back to myself. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to double click on that? And talk, tell us a little bit more about what happened. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so at this organization, there's probably a couple parts that I should, should mention. I was hired to be the the assistant director of work readiness and job development. But what that meant was, is that I, that I was given a job where I was the senior to a lot of women, primarily women of color, also some trans women who had masters, who had PhDs, right? And not that my degree didn't mean anything, right? But I was clearly not, not qualified to be their boss. Um, but I wasn't cognizant enough of, of my own male privilege and access to think that, oh, they gave me this job. Great. Lucky me. Right. Um, and um, at the time, during lunchtime, many of the young kids were unhoused, marginally housed, whatever. So on Mondays and Fridays, oftentimes the Monday meal was their first meal of the weekend. Right. And the Friday meal was was going to be their last meal for the weekend. So they were oftentimes like, like very, very um, agitated and rightfully so. So during that time, you're trying to make sure that every young person can eat. And I was in charge of the lunchroom space at that time. And one of the, the women who I worked with, her, her and I kind of had a disagreement about like how should kind of the framework of that day go. And because I was agitated and other things, during the, our back and forth, I looked at her and I said, sweetie, I need you to calm down. And she looked at me and she said, don't you ever call me sweetie. And I retreated into what I call the good guy syndrome, where I tried to excuse away my, my behavior. But I was also excusing away her humanity, where I said mm -hmm. things like, well, I'm a good guy and you know me. And well, I call everybody sweetie. Right. And at that time, my supervisor, her, a woman named... Mm -hmm. Lillian Rivera, she called me to her office a couple of days later and she said, um, walk me through what you think caused Erica to respond the way that she did to you calling her sweetie. And, and I gave her what I thought was a very eloquent answer. She looked at me, she said, great. She reached behind her desk and she grabbed this book. The book was by um, the author Bell Hooks. And the book is called Feminist Theory from Margin to Center. She said, I want you to go home and read this. And then you'll come back in a week or so and we'll talk about it again. So I go home, I read it. The, the book, that version of the book was about a hundred and sorry, it's about 231 pages. I go back and I read it. She asked me the exact same question. What do you think caused Erica to react the way that she did when you called her sweetie? I gave her what I call the even more thoughtful answer. She says, great, read it again. I look at her and I go, 
all right, you're in charge. I'm going to read it again. I read it the second time, week and a half or, or, or some, some time passes. I go back to her office. She asks me the exact same question. I give her what I think is an even more thoughtful answer. She goes, oh, Wade, I can't believe you. Aren't you just wonderful? I need you to read it again. And I look <laughs> at her, right? And I look at her and I go, why don't you just tell me what you want me to know? And she pauses and, and she says, if I tell you, this issue won't become personal to you because it's mm. personal to Erica. I need it to be personal to you. So I said, all right. I go home and I read it a third time, about maybe two thirds of the way through, it dawned on me, this book was not about Erica at all. This book was about me. And that what I was trying to do was place all of the blame, place all of the discomfort back on Erica. And I didn't want to sit in, in the discomfort. I didn't want to sit in, in the space of knowing that I would, I, I have never in my entire life called a man sweetie. Never, right? And there were so many other things that she helped me to unpack during that conversation. And this book really reflected back so many different things. The other thing that this book did was it helped me understand that the root of homophobia was sexism. That all of the things that I had experienced as a gay man, as a queer man, right, was rooted back to gender bias, was, was rooted back to gender oppression. And that really changed the way that I moved about the world. So no longer was I an advocate for LGBT equality. I was trying to, to get back to the root, right? To the root that is oftentimes, many of the oppressions that folks face are rooted in racial or gender bias. So that is why for me to call myself a feminist is super Im important because it reminds me that I still don't know enough, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and even when I think I know something, the thing that I should realize more is I don't know much at, at all and, and I should read it again. Mm. Mm. How potent is that? Right, Ooh. yeah. You know, it's interesting because I am a woman who went to college in the 80s and, you know, this is after the Gloria Steinem, who's, you know, kind of took to the national stage and Ms. Magazine and the whole thing. And, and there got to be a point where women like me, young women like me were like, feminism, it, it led us all in the wrong direction, right? I, I don't want to be a feminist. I want to be post-feminist because <laughs> feminism had gotten a, a, a bad word, right? And the reason it had is because we're all so baked into the system of the patriarchy and this is the way it goes. And we are wearing our Betty business bows to our summer jobs and trying to be like <laughs> men and trying to act like men and pretending we didn't have our periods when we we're presenting in the middle of the meeting and we just felt our period come through and we're like, how am I gonna make it through this meeting? And, and denying so much of our, our womanhood. And so we couldn't be feminists. It didn't, mm. it didn't fit into the narrative of who we could be. So we're like, oh, those women, they set us up for bad news because what happened is they started progressing really fast and the men that we wanna date, they're not progressing as fast. So we're gonna be post-feminist. We're going to be post the feminist movement because that's going to help us be more relatable. Yeah. And yeah. we denied it for so long. And I think the reason is this, and I'd love your take on this. I was not told what feminism means. I was told that feminism is a movement that's going to kill America. Mm. I'd love you to thoughts on that. And I'd love for us to talk about what feminism does mean. Yeah, um, so, you know, I think I got relatively lucky because I, you know, the term feminism, feminist, I had heard, but I had never really spent any time wrestling with the, with the concept. Um, so the first time I was introduced to it, it was the story that I told you, but it was something that felt affirming to me in a way like it felt liberatory in a lot of ways. But when I've done my research and gone back, the thing that I think that feminism offers that no other movement has, has offered is that feminism is constantly critiquing itself because it welcomes all. Feminism is not a movement for women. It's not a movement for LGBTQ folks. Like there's an opportunity in feminism for all of us to in, engage. And to your point, 
what 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 often happens is is um, when a movement, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's Me Too, is winning, and what I mean by winning is reclaiming the narrative. Those the powers that be right come up with a new narrative, right? And then what often happens is is to your point, like there are some people who want to ally themselves with the dominant group because they believe that that's going to make them safe. And, and I believe that many people who were kind of kind of trying to be, whether it's post-racial or post-feminist, what they're, what they're doing is they're allowing their fears, right, to get the better of them because they don't believe, because um, I think that, that Gloria Steinem said this, the closer we get to freedom, the most, like you're, the greater danger that you're in because those that are in power actually will do anything to maintain power, right? When when the dominant group feels like that that they're in great control, they will throw you some bones. They'll throw you some little shillings out there. But the closer that they feel that 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 the feminist group or Black Lives Matter is winning, then they actually start to to come down harder. And I think that that's what we're witnessing now. If you think about the backlash to me too, right? It was people going, men aren't that bad and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And, and they were trying to tell a new story, right? But what they wouldn't interrogate was that yet again, the Me Too movement, in, in my opinion, was not about women. You already knew what was happening in the workplace, right? I didn't know. And, and what I mean by I is men, right? Like we didn't actually know. So the movements are never about the group that it started in. Right, the group that has started is trying to elevate the consciousness of the of the dominant group who doesn't have to know. Right, um, so I would just say that we have got to see feminism through the lens of like this is one of the most powerful, smartest, most thoughtful movement ever because it's never afraid to keep ev evolving. Like if you think about how the movement started when it was primarily white women. And then you, you you had this Sojourner Truth moment of ain't I a, a woman, right? Like that was the movement critiquing itself, right? And there are always these moments of the movement critiquing itself. And that's a movement that I want to be a part of because it never stays static because oppression is never static. And if you guys have not read Sojourner Truth, that's just someone jot that name down or I'll type it in later. <laughs> um, I and mean, there's some truth right there, right? <laughs> hmm. You know, I think one of the challenges that many women face, and if we're really painting this picture of future her is a place where all voices are included at the table. When, when we're imagining this new future, we're taking the existing systems, we're pushing them aside for just a minute because we can't change what exists, it's too hard. So what if we build this parallel universe and we start living the way we want to and you know what's going to happen. All those people over there are like, I don't want a piece of that. And so we're just going to keep going. We're going to keep our values. We're going to stand for what matters. And when women and men and every other kind of person in the whole world, whether they have this orientation or that orientation around gender, around sexuality, all of it, when we when we combine voices, when we sing from the same songbook, we get to create a world that works for more people. At which point, names, labels, movements don't matter, but movements exist to fight against what we currently have, to try to take the course of history and bend it in a different direction for the future. And I would love to have you speak to men for a minute about what they cannot see. Because obviously it's like I had my waking up white, right? Yeah. And I, I, it was not one time. <laughs> it was many, many, many layers of my waking up whiteness. And I'm still waking up white. Yeah. yeah. I was, and you are waking up a man. You're waking yeah. up to understanding that role. So can you help us understand what that feels like, looks like, sounds like, how men might be able to see what we're talking about? Yeah, I'll give a story and, and then I'll offer something that's, um, so I'll try to offer something specific and then maybe something more theor theoretical. Um, okay. So I spent, I spent two years, um, I think it was from 2016 to 2018 and I only read books written by women. 
And I was, you know, um, I was shocked at how much I didn't know, right? I mean, just at how much I didn't know. Um, and then I, my, my partner and I, and one of his close friends and his wife, we all took a road trip together. And we were driving back from Palm Springs and we all had to use the restroom. So we get out of the car and uh, Ebony, who's my, my partner's friend's wife, she goes to the bathroom first and I'm next in, in line. And she goes into the bathroom and two minutes go by, four minutes go by, six minutes go by. And in my mind, I'm like, what the hell is she doing in there? Like, doesn't she realize that I, the people are behind her and we all have to really use the bathroom, right? And finally she comes out and, and I am, I've told myself some really not, not nice stories about her selfishness, right? And I get into the bathroom and I look around and, I, and, and I'm thinking, oh, Shit, I'm so sexist. The bathroom was a disaster, Harry. And I realized, I was like, yeah, I get to just come in here. I can, you know, use the restroom and not really have to worry about the cleanliness of this bathroom because I actually do not have to touch anything, right? Mm -hmm. She does not have the same opportunity. Like she literally had to almost clean the bathroom for her to actually use it. So we get, so I leave the bathroom and I get in the car and I go, Ebony, I need to apologize to you. And she goes, for what? And then I told her what, what happened. And she goes, oh, that, that happens all the time, right? But what she did, right, was she let me off the hook, right? Oftentimes how, how people from marginalized groups do, because like folks don't want to feel like they're adding on, like, because in potentially in, in, in her mind, right? Like I recognize my sexism, my bias, whatever you want to call it, right? And I atoned for, right? But instead, I would have loved for her to push me a little bit more, right? And to go, okay, and then what? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Just, just, and then what? Because that question puts the onus back on me to, to go, now what are you gonna do now to lessen the likelihood that that doesn't happen again? And what I was thinking as I was riding the car, I was like, what would it, I was like, what would a bathroom look like if women had invented it? You know, like it would look like the stall, Right, because you know, there's this kind of belief that if if you start with those who are at the margins, and you make sure that they have comfort, right, and you work your way up, you get everybody. So let's take that mm -hmm. analogy with this, right? If a woman built a stand up stall where women can utilize and pee in it without having to sit, right, I'm confident I could use it too. Mm -hmm. I'm very confident, right? So that just speaks to that idea, right? That if you start yeah. with those who are the furthest from the power, all of us benefit. And what I think has happened is that we actually show up in a space of thinking that we want to help. We as men think that we want to help women. And I'm using we because I'm implicated in this, right? And there's a quote by this indigenous Australian activist named Leela Watson. It's my favorite quote in, the, in this space. And she says, if you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. Ooh. Oftentimes, the concept of help, we don't recognize that there's a hierarchy there. I right? need you to say that quote again because it's so powerful. <laughs> Please say it yeah. again. Yeah, and the quote is, if you've come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, let's work together, right? So if we mm. think about that toilet, right? The, 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 the ease of both of us being able to use the toilet means that I need to make sure that you're not just in the room, right? That when I'm coming up with the invention, that you have a voice in the room that's respected, that's valued, and maybe you created the actual room and invited me into it. You know what mm. I mean? So, so oftentimes we think that, oh, I want to help women and blah, blah, blah. No, like you're looking to partner with women. And when you think about the language of partner, it sends a different, like there's a dynamic that you have to wrestle with from a power standpoint. Because even in your home relationships, right? It's never, it's never ever 50-50, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's 60-40, it's 80-20, it's, you know, it's one to 99, right? But there's a constant mix on that because you're sitting in partnership wrestling with what the other needs. Right. And and it's not that I'm in relationship with my partner thinking that how can I help him? Right. Because when I think about the work of white people, it's I don't need your help. What I need is for you to get the white racism out of my way so that I can do it myself. 
And what I believe that women have been saying to men is like, we don't need your help. I'm perfectly capable of doing this. I would love for us to be partners in it. But if you don't want to be partners, get the sexism out of my way and trust me, I got this. And that's the thing that I've had to really wrestle with is how often am I showing up in spaces where, I'm, where I think I'm ready to sit in community women, but I'm actually there to help because I haven't unpacked how I've been socialized to think of women as always in need of something. And me as a man, that I'm there to bring that need and to satisfy that actual need. Yeah, oh, this is so juicy. And thank you all for your beautiful comments. Um, there's so much to unpack here, you know. I, I teach a class called The Girlfriend's Guide to Unpacking White Privilege. And mm -hmm. a whole part of it is like the white virgin narrative that has happened in film. If you even think about King Kong, right? There was this <laughs> black <laughs> ape, let's not be so subtle here, that takes a white woman in a ball gown and climbs up to the top of a building, the Empire State Building. We, we couldn't be more racist and have this virgin narrative, this pure white woman who's being attacked. And it is so baked into who we are that most people are like, King Kong, they just remade it. Isn't that amazing? And I'm like, could you remake uh, 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 Birth of a Nation? I mean, who? All right, for those of you who don't know what Birth of a Nation is, um, Google it, because you, you must know. <laughs> It's the most racist piece of film ever made, and it was made not as racist, knowing itself was racism. It was just racist, pure up and simple. It's about the Ku Klux Klan. And, um, you know, the problem is that we have very little ability to look at ourselves in these situations. And one of the gifts I see in you is that you're so inquisitive you're now noticing whenever you had your waking up moment through this reading this book over and over again it's like how did you then keep that open mind because this is what we're missing when women cannot be fully seen we're always told things like well there are i, I notice the trends women are doing better really that's what you're noticing the trend that women are doing better uh we're 51 percent of the population what the F are you thinking right now? <laughs> How do you keep this mind open? Because it's, it's, it's so baked around us. Our society is everything inside the matrix. And you got to keep busting out over and over again. Yeah, so I'll be honest. I'm, I'm very imperfect, right? And, and I want to continually be imperfect, right? Um, but there's, uh, there's two things that I do that I there's three specific things I do, but two things that I constantly think about a lot. And I'm not sure, and you may push me on both of these. So please feel comfortable to, to do that. One is I don't think of myself as a good person. I truly don't. I don't, you will never hear me call myself a good person. What I am is someone who is constantly trying to be better because the idea of goodness, what else would I call myself but a good person? You know what I mean? Like, have you ever met someone that goes, I'm a bad person? You know what I mean? Like, there have been some awful, there have been some awful people who've done some awful things in this world, but they would tell you that they were a good person, right? Someone loved them. You know what I mean? Right? So I try to really wrestle with the idea of goodness and, and go, no one actually cares if I'm harming them if I think I'm a good person. You know what I mean? Like, when, when I called Erica Sweetie, I don't think she cared at that moment. Right, like she was more concerned with the impact of my actions, not not my goodness of intent. Right, so that's the mm -hmm. one thing that I wrestle with is that I never and when I do trainings, I always tell people, can we be disinterested in even to think of ourselves as good people just for this moment? Right. The other thing is, can I be disinterested in needing to be right? Because being right is actually also it's a trap because the world is changing so fast. Right, like. What was in vogue on Monday is probably going to be out of out of step on Friday, right? And if I was right on Monday and I'm wrong on Friday, then like, how do I show up in the world? But if I'm constantly trying to get better, constantly keeping like um, having a learning posture, right? Then mm -hmm. being right is actually not what I'm invested in. The the mm -hmm. the the last thing that I do is is I surround myself with people who are invested in me being better, 
right? Who will who will call me in and call me out, but do it with love. If I and I, I mentioned my first boss, right? Like she called me in. Sometimes I need to be called out, right? But if I'm not invested in my own goodness, I can hear the critique. But if I'm invested in my own goodness, I can't hear because I'm like, well, I'm a good person. You know, um, one of my close friends, Michael Denzel Smith, I'm going to chew, I'm going to botch up his quote, but he's, he says that some of us are too invested in our own goodness and not invested in being better. And that's the problem. And, and, and that is something that I wrestle with a lot is like, is this me trying to be good in this moment? Or is this me actually trying to be better? Um, so if we surround ourselves with people and give them the carte blanche to call us out, you know what I mean? And, and during our, our pre-call, right, I was like, hey, I may step in it, call me in in that moment. Like, I'm okay with that because I'm, I'm disinterested and people on this call thinking I'm a good person. I really am. I'm interested in people on this call going, huh? Wade said something, but he also said something I didn't uh, agree with. I want to, I want to email him. I want to Instagram him. You know what I mean? Because like that's what feminism does. Like feminism is always like, ah, let's let's try this again. Let let's get it better. So I would just say that um that to to take the blinders off and on requires us to to be disinterested in so many so many different things. So good. I. I I could double click on like 95% of those words and go real deep on all of them. But I just want to say a couple of things in reflection. Um, something you guys have been hearing me say for the past two days during this conference is that the only, pro the only perfection is progress. It is the only perfection in the world. And when we're trying to wait, especially as women, before we do something, we launch something, we leave someone, we make a decision for ourselves that we, we are waiting for perfection so that we can go like perfection gives us permission and that is not true at all the only perfection is your own progress and so the only comparison you ever need to make is to do you that you were yesterday and that's what i'm hearing you say now i want to push on you a little bit please i think it's okay to be a good person as okay. long as you're a good person who's in progress if you're in a good person because your ego is so attached to being a good person, you're not a person who's interested in progress. You're not a person who's interested in getting better every day. But there's a thing called going from good to great. And there's from great to excellence. And there's from excellence to transcendence. And all of it is amazing as long as our ego is not attached. And so many of you have heard me talk about giving myself an egoectomy. I am not what I have. I am not what I do. I am not what you think of me. And by the way, I am so imperfect at this because some days I think I am what I have and I am what I do and I am what I say. And for those of you who are going to tune in tomorrow morning when my best friend, BFF, ex-boyfriend, roommate, and I are going to talk about our relationship. Oh my God, sometimes it's messy, but we're working towards something bigger than a definition. And so I just, the only place I would push you is to say, it's okay to be good as long as you're a person in progress. Now you may disagree with me and that is totally fine, but I love that you said to me in our prep call, push me. You're the only person during our prep call said, push me. And I love that because there's a hunger for more. There's a hunger for depth. There's a hunger for undoing and an appreciation for it. I don't know if you and I talked about some prep call, but I upgrade myself like software. <laughs> I started when I was 27 I like that. years old. I was broken as hell when I was 27. And I gave myself a year long theme and I sucked at it for the first four months of the year. The theme was to only be dramatic when drama was necessary because I was working in Hollywood and everybody's pulling drama all the time. And I was like, I cannot pull out the drama. I'm going to turn into one of those people. I don't want to be one of those people. They can be no judgment. That's just not for me. Right. And so every time I finish, I complete a level of my own upgrade. I just give myself a software upgrade. So I went from Suzanne 1.0 to Suzanne 2.0 in that first year. But the next years, maybe it was like three years it took me to get to Suzanne 3.0 because I went through 3.1 and 3.2. And sometimes it was a big leap, like a 3.7. Mm. As long as the direction is up, the road is like the stock market up and down on the way up very true 
Very true. So what if we're good and we're striving for I will that? promise to wrestle with it. I promise to wrestle with it. I won't be okay. that guy that, that, that wants to push back on it. I'm going to sit in that and, and breathe it in. Yeah, and here's the thing. I don't need to be right either. I don't need to be liked either. And um, I think this is a really hard concept for some people to grasp because the society around us tells us that being right and liked are very, very important, especially to our so success true. in this world. And so how can men, as the representative of all men, <laughs> how can men in your mind, in your estimation, the one who currently is listening to this conversation goes, I have no fucking idea what they're talking about. <laughs> How could they start? Um, I think first, um, the first responsibility is is to be honest with yourself. And if you and if that first honesty is to say, I don't know what they're talking about, then then tell more people that, right? Because the more people that you tell that you don't know, you'll find that one person who could go, great, let's let's talk about it, right? One of the things that James Baldwin says that I love, he says, when you ask a question, any question, you immediately know more, right? Mm. So how do we get men to start asking more questions? Now, what I don't want men to do is ask women those questions so that you all have to continually do more labor. There's a canon of literature out there, right? So when you ask yourself a question, Google it, chat GBT, <laughs> whatever the thing is called, right? But don't just trust chat GBP, ask chat GP for the book or Google the book, right? Then get the book. Men, I think should also, Instead of starting video game clubs, start a book club. Imagine that, right? Get your drink of choice, right? And sit around and debate, right? These concepts, because again, you will immediately know more. We've got to get out of our echo chamber. We can't sit in rooms like there are no two men that are alike. And that means that there are no two men that agree on the concept of feminism the exact same way, right? So, right. So how do we start to sit? How do we start to have our barbershops that are around wrestling with these types of concepts, right? Instead of going to the barbershop, only talking about sports or only talking about cars, right? Like let's actually bring in some different ideas and some concepts that we're afraid of, right? Um, the, the other thing that I like to, uh, to do that's, that's somewhat um, strange, some people own my shit publicly, right? Like what does it mean for me to come on your show and to say, I'm sexist and because I am, right? I am like, and, and some people could say, oh, wait, you get it, blah, blah, blah. I, I will never fundamentally fully get it. When I read Viola Davis's autobiography, I, I don't think I had an appreciation of all the identities that she held. And when I read her book, it hit me like a ton of bricks, right? And I know Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality and the work by Emma de Graffenried, who's the black woman that that term was invented for, right? So I've read all of that, right? But when you read someone's autobiography, the thing that I do, that's my own secret weapon, is when I read a book, let's say that you have a book out, Suzanne, that's your memoir, and you're telling a story about a man who's done something really awful to you. I try to become that man. I don't try to distance myself from that man. I try to go, in what ways have I been him, right? Mm. Because once I can do that, right, it doesn't create distance between me and this person because it's easy to go, he's the monster, I'm, I'm the good guy, right? I want to become the monster because here's the thing. Oftentimes, the things that causes men or anyone in the dominant group to treat someone else a certain way, I've experienced those same fears and emotions too. Right. If you polled your exact audience to, to say, hey, like, what are some feelings that, that you've experienced? There's not an infinite number of feelings out there. Like there's anxiety. There's I'm scared. I'm, I'm all of these things. Right. And and all of us would raise a hand and go, I've experienced those things, too. Right. So so we can actually become the other person. And I'm going to quote James Baldwin again. Sorry about that. But he's he yeah. says it's our it's our suffering that connects us to each other. But if I'm reading your book and you're telling me a story about something that's happening to you and I don't use my suffering to connect with yours, then I can't figure out, oh, in this moment, here's what Suzanne might need in partnership, right? So how do I, how do I stop trying to distance myself from the experience, but actually become the monster in the experience? 
and and that requires a certain level of of um or well, for me it's required a certain level of humility to know that i'm no better than what this other person did you know because there there is like i've done some things i'm not proud of right so there's a fine line between like what this other person did and i might do right so i never say i would never have done that that's not the truth i've never been in that situation to know if i wouldn't do that right because yeah. in certain situations like folks without like i used to always tell folks you, you know i would never say this about a person and then one day you know i say it right so i try to also <laughs> not say that the other thing that i would say to men we is we've got to stop saying we don't know that this thing that women that women are experiencing is is happening right so you had men during me too who would go oh my god i didn't know but this will be the same man that the day before will will say i care about gender equality because i have a daughter so you just told me that you don't want your daughter to experience the world in a certain way. So if you didn't know, then why are you worried about what your daughter's going to experience, right? It's called benevolent sexism, right? Because we as men, we do know, right? So when men have daughters, they're worried about all of the things that the world's going to do to their daughter. That means we do know. The, the challenge is we don't want to take responsibility for knowing. So that's why we pretend as if we don't know. Because if we know, then someone can try to hold us accountable. Mm. I don't know if you guys heard this reframe, but I need to repeat it because it's so absolutely genius. Um, what Wade said here is that if I wrote a book and it and and I said it's about something horrible that happened to me, and by the way, there's been a list this long of ways that I have been in the corporate American system and outside of it, really treated and mistreated by men because of being the only woman in the room. And what Wade is saying is instead of putting himself in my shoes to feel empathy for me, he's putting himself in the shoes of the perpetrator of the act to say, how close can I see that person? What can I learn about myself if I put myself in those shoes? It's a different set of shoes. And I've never heard this perspective before. And I think this is something that like we need to spread loud and wide because I think that's the missing ingredient that I have been seeing is I, I speak to so many men and they're like, yeah, I, I, it, it would never happen here. I really don't understand how it happens there. And yet, you know, that they were in fraternity parties that, you know, <laughs> trust me, we know, yeah, we know, <laughs> you know, and, and men who have daughters who want to pretend that we weren't abused at work and that we weren't assaulted at work and that we weren't, you know, they, we don't walk down dark cor corners worried about black men. No, we're worried about men, right? How do you not know? And so being able to actually put yourself in the shoes of the perpetrator of the act is a unique perspective. That is a different perspective. I'm not going to say you're a good poor person for doing it. I'm going to say <laughs> you're a man who is in progress. And you're heading towards your own individual perfection because it's these perspectives that can change what's going on. Women yeah. gather in covens to talk about things and to complain about things. And, and we hold fault in the same, in the sense that we've not been brave enough to speak up loudly enough. And it's usually because our financial dependence has been linked to a man around us, whether it's our father, our uncle, our grandfather, our boss, our husband, our partner, our financial well being has often been linked. And, and then we as men know that. We as men know that. And we take advantage. And so what happened is we got into the working world and we're like, yeah, if I act like a dude, I'll make money like a dude. And then I won't have to be afraid of speaking my mind and doing what I wanna do because I'll be financially independent and I can be free. Mm -mm, doesn't happen that way. Or it happens to women in rarefied air. We've got to make it okay for women at every level to not fear speaking up. Some of my executive coaching clients, I've been working with them for years to get them to speak up to their bosses about when their bosses take credit for the work that they have done. They don't share any of the ability to give and share the recognition because 
they're all climbing the ladder. And if I, if a woman can make the guy look better to his bosses that he's playing golf with, he's gonna not give any recognition because it makes him look less than in his own aspirations for promotion. Yeah, you know, one of the things you, you, you made me think of is, you know, as a little boy, I remember being raised, and I think that this is common for most boys, we're raised through a scarcity model, meaning that it's me or no one, mm -hmm. right? And that as you're moving up the, you know, the ranks of the corporate space, right, that scarcity model starts to show up even more because now it's doggy dog. And, and why would I give you any credit for this when if I take the credit, no one's going to believe you anyway, mm -hmm. right? Because I've already, you know, I've created the game. So the game is rigged as soon as you come into it. Right. You know, it's it's one of the, the reasons that um, I'm not a huge fan of the business case for IND um, be, because the business case has been made since 1970. It, it, it has women have made it over and over and remade it. Right. And but what is true. Right. Is that the ask for the business case itself is sex. Right. Because men have never had to make the business. We never make the business case for us. Like there is no business case for men to be in charge. It's axiomatic, it's self-evident, right? Or at least that's what we believe that it should be, right? But yet we go say to you, hey, go make the business case for you to be here. And at first when we're like, well, there's none of us there. How can I make the case, you idiot, right? But, but then as more women rolls in the ranks, right? That became the labor that we asked women to do. That's a distraction technique. It's, it's a distraction for you to have to make the case for yourself. Because what they're really saying is prove to me who doesn't believe you have value that you have value right and like 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 that in itself is such a nefarious act right imagine me telling you susan hey you know like prove to me that you have some humanity worth my time you're like well i'm not sure how to do that and like that's just like we get caught up in that cycle of having to prove to the other group our value and our hu hum humanity so when when i witness certain acts Instead of me going, I would never do that. I, I like to say, huh, when I have been in that situation, what was happening for me? Like what was going on in me? And oftentimes fear, scarcity is fear, right? You know, like when you see people marching saying things like you will not, re you will not replace us. Right? What they're saying is like, hey, like I have value and you're taking away my actual value, but they saw their their value as their foot on our necks. Like, like that was their value, right? So we have to one, stop doing labor for us and start and start asking questions that force people to be self-reflective. So whenever someone, let's say someone who is straight or someone who is white, right, wants me to do labor for them, I like to repeat the question back. Like what you're asking me, repeat it back so that you hear, right? So that I can actually put the labor back on you and the only thing that I would tell women, and I don't like to give women advice because what the hell do I really know, is don't do the labor for us. Trust, trust that we will get there. You're an executive coach. You, you know this, this theory that people have everything inside of them that they need. The question is, is, can we ask the right questions for us to arrive at that on our own, right? And mm -hmm. women, sometimes, instead of asking us the question of putting the work back on us, they do what my boss wouldn't do. They, you all don't make us read it again. Because if, if she had told me what she wanted me to get, it wouldn't have been personal. I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you, right? We got to get men to make these issues personal. And it's not the daughter that makes it personal. Because if you had a wife, you maybe should have cared then. Like, like, what are you saying about your wife when you care now about your actual daughter, right? So how do we get men to see that, that, that sexism, that patriarchy, is a virus and viruses spread and they've spread to us. They've sickened us. Like, like we as men have to be comfortable with male to male intimacy. We can't see, like if any guy listening to this, if you've got a best friend, you enjoy male to male intimacy. If you've got a best friend, you are attracted to that human being. You're not attracted to him sexually, right? But you're attracted to that person, right? And that means that, that, that there are conversations that you need to have. Women have, um, 
have historically set in intimate relationships with women, had these hard conversations, grown, expanded each other. We as men need to create more spaces where we can be comfortable with our intimacy with each other. Right now, we just posture and puff our chest up and do all these things, right? But what, but what we really want is intimacy with each other. That's what we really want. I don't know how tasty you guys think this is, but I'm like, you know, <laughs> I live on both coasts. I have a home here in Boston. I have a home in Los Angeles. People ask me all the time, what's the difference? I mean, besides the fact that they are 100% orthogonally different. In California in general, I've lived in both Los Angeles and San Francisco. There are men's circles. It's a thing. Men gather, they get go to the beach, they have a bonfire, they talk, they do book groups, they, they expose their inner feelings and their fears, and it is a beautiful thing. And the equal activity in Boston is they, they gather to watch sports. There's no talking, right? And it's, it's like, you can, just in me saying it, you can feel the difference, right? And I think that this is such a beautiful expression of what is needed is that for men to find their own humanity so that they can see the humanity in women and I think that's what I'm learning from you today I couldn't say it better I couldn't say it better and so if we can do things in our homes in our families with your sons as you're raising young people as you're raising strong young girls to learn to speak up and say mm -mm, I'm not taking that that's yours right we need to find that voice. And so this future her that we're imagining together is like, we can't be in partnership with some men until they're willing to find their own humanity. And when they do, we can work on our humanity together. Hmm. Good stuff. We should Thank take the so show much. on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make time. I love it. You know, Wade, I have personally learned so much from you. I know we met through Brene um, and good people all around. We didn't know each other before this conference. You are the yeah. one of a couple of people who I didn't know before this all started. And this conversation is so deep and so important and so beautiful. And I just want to thank you for holding space for it, for being vulnerable, for admitting your own weaknesses and your own imperfection because that's not something that most people with a Y chromosome know how to do and I for one am a better person because of it can I read a poem to you that um absolutely that speaks that speaks to that um so this poem is by a Lokman and uh, they are a a non-binary uh, poet. Um, um, they're a comic, they're an artist. And the poem is called, Perfection is Loneliness. And the poem mm -hmm. goes like this. It says, I am ignorant and superficial and sentimental. That is my intelligence. I am insecure, needy, scared. That is my strength. I'm confused, contradictory, and chaotic. That is my truth. I am imperfect, irrational, insufficient. That is my beauty. I do not know who I am. I do not know what I'm doing. But what I do know is that I am honest, which means what I do know is that I need you, which means that I do know is that I don't want to be perfect because that would mean I do not need you. What I do know is I don't wanna be perfect because that would mean I didn't need you. So I just leave your audience with, with that, you know, to your comment around the progress and not the perfection. Perfection as this poem is called is loneliness. And progress means that we're coming together, we're building, we're owning our strengths, we're owning our intelligence, we're owning our truth and we're owning our beauty. So thank you, Suzanne, for allowing me to do that. I'm going to have to like write to you after this and find the name of that poem and the poet because they sound amazing. And I know. Oh, Alok is maybe the most amazing person alive right now. <laughs> How do you spell it? 
How do you it's spell it? It's A A L O K. Last name a M. Yeah, last name M E N O N, and the poem is called "Perfection Is Loneliness." Mm. Look that one up, everybody. That's a good one. Perfection is loneliness, and that should help all of us move forward in the most beautiful way. Wade, thank you for your time. Thank you for your talent. Thank, thank you. you for sharing your heart and your soul. I look forward to being friends for a long time. I can't wait to go to Agape with you when I get back. And Me too. <laughs> that's going to be fun. We're going to sing together. We're going to have a good old time. I got so to practice my voice then. I haven't sung in a while. <laughs> it's okay. All voices are welcome. No matter how on tune or off tune, it's all beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good day. Have a beautiful night. Bye.